Welcome everyone. This is part five of a six part series, staying in conversation about racism. My name is Kiersey Aulin. I'm the director of the Ombuds Office here at CU Boulder. And my partner in this journey is Donna Mejia, uh, who is an associate professor of theater and dance and affiliate for ethnic studies and women and gender studies. Um, if you are unfamiliar with, um, with a Zoom platform, if you hover your cursor across the bottom of your window, there, would, there are a number of action items that appear. We'd like you to open your chat function. So you just go to chat and click it, and that will open it. From time to time, during our presentation today, we will ask you to comment, and that's where you would do that. Also, it gives you an opportunity to see the comments and various uh, contributions of your colleagues who are participating in this webinar. Our co-host today is Elizabeth Hill. If you have questions uh, while Donna and I are presenting, please address them to, to Liz. Um, Donna and I will not be checking the chat box uh, for those kinds of questions while we present, only as we chat or at the Q&A session at the end. Unlike our other webinars in the Ombuds Office, the series um, that we're doing today uh, is about 45 minutes with about 10 minutes of Q&A. This was a specific request from people that attended our first webinar, uh, wanting the session to be longer. Okay. We want to start with an acknowledgement of the land um, and, oops, there we go. Um, we want to remind ourselves that the University of Colorado operates on native land associated with the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations. And in addition, 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. Donna, you're on mute. Thank you. Strange how that happened. I wanted to say mitakwi oyasin. Salutations to all my relations, my ancestors of the Mississippi Choctaw and the Alabama Kushata. We would also like to share with you the pledge that we put up every time we visit with you that we will be encouraging and humorous in our offerings. We will explain thoughtfully and clearly. We will offer citation for what we have learned and concede openly what we have not yet learned. We will ensure a welcoming, judgment-free and inviting environment where counterpoint ideas can be exchanged diplomatically. Our discussion will welcome new ideas and perspectives and we will remain open and receptive to these concepts changing and transforming based on our conversations with you. Please let us know if you perceive glaring holes in our research. We intend to give you tools to increase your conversancy, expand your boundaries, nurture independence. We have no interest in telling you what to think. Rather, we are passionate about helping you to ask better questions so the world can reveal its self-evident truths to you without interference from socially indoctrinated filters. We will respect our differences in and out of this experience because your dignity and comfort are important to us. And in return, we ask for your courage, your diplomacy, your open thinking, and your active involvement. We hold ourselves accountable to the same caliber and standards we are requesting of you. Thank you for being here. And I do want to mention, because I forgot to mention in the beginning, that if you've registered for this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that includes all the resources we're mentioning today, and there are many. Additionally, as we're talking about resources, uh, Liz will be posting them in the chat. You might be able to open a link from there, but we know that the way some people's Zoom is set up um, prohibits them from doing that. We don't have control over that, but don't worry. You will get a link both to a video of this um, discussion as well as the resources um, afterwards. We're starting with 
a reminder that to show up imperfectly, but to but open to change is better than not showing up at all. And the idea of offering resources today is to inspire you to begin, if you haven't yet already, or further your journey of increasing your knowledge of how to be an effective change agent to really make sure that we eradicate racism, that we eradicate discrimination, that we eradicate implicit bias, and that colonialism can no longer find a supportive foothold anywhere on the planet, that slavery cannot have a foothold on the planet because we're aiming for enough informed citizens that people would resist these efforts. So remember, no matter where you are in your journey, we're trying to present a starting point with resources today to go a little further and then the deep dive um, after that. Resource number one, yourself, your own experiential learning and your own inner voice. Paying attention to when things don't feel right, paying attention to when you feel highly defensive, paying attention to when you feel aggressed upon and imposed upon, uh, paying attention to your self-worth if you feel you have been a, the recipient of racism and really finding and tuning into that inner voice and following the questions and the curiosities and the need for care that can come out of those inner whisperings. So we wanted to validate you as a very important resource in this journey. So we invite you, whoops, advance one, okay. We invite you to fill up a seat to an in-progress conversation. So some of you may have already been involved with this conversation about racism in the United States. Some of you are new to this. I know that since the murder of George Floyd, many white Americans have um, been shaken and have realized that they need to inform themselves. And so just know that there are so many people who have been working on the issue of racism in this country for 400 years, really. And so we'd like you to think about the kinds of resources that are available to you. And note that there will be differences of opinion among the folks who have been working in anti-racist ways for a long time, and that's okay. Uh, you need to find your own way in this material. And we would like to offer up some things to think about. When someone is offering commentary, are you looking at primary sources? Or are you looking at secondary or even tertiary sources? Are, is the speaker or the person voicing an opinion an outside narrator or an interpreter? Or are they someone speaking from within experience? Does this person or author or group of people seem to have blind spots, biases, or ulterior agendas? So for example, as in any community of people, you will sometimes have people that engage in takedowns or an attempted takedowns of others because they perceive their ideas as not as valid as their own. Don't limit yourself to materials you agree with. I think this is very, very important from a brain science perspective. It is much too easy to only limit your exploration to things you are naturally drawn to. Dimensionalize your understanding with differences of opinion. There are many differences of opinion. There is not a monolithic opinion or the right thing to do. There are many things that can be done and there are many opinions of how things can be done. And here I'd like to reference Chimamanda Adichie. Um, we have a picture of her at the bottom and she has a TED talk, uh, which is the danger of a single narrative. And I appreciate what she says so much. And she has such a clear and stark way of expressing that. And this is really what we're talking about here. Allow in your exploration 
for multiple opinions, approaches, strategies to coexist. You know, that is the reality of life. You want to ask yourself, does the resource encourage self-sufficiency and increased understanding? Or does, the resource, does it do something very different than that? Um, does it look to sort of loft responsibility onto people and not participate in finding a solution? Um, the materials presented that we present here today may have conflicting, conflicting perspectives and opinions. That's okay. We, Don and I don't personally agree with everything that's stated in every resource that we're sharing. We do think it's important that everyone expose themselves to the variety of approaches and ideas. Uh, so just be aware as you dive into materials, videos, uh, reading materials, that you're going to find differences. And you may find things that appeal more to you than others. That's completely okay. Did you want to chime in, Donna? Yeah, not only is it okay, it's actually ideal that the journey of the inquiry will enrich you, even if you don't come up with a very clear answer at this very moment, that being on the journey means allowing yourself to be dimensionalized in many ways over and over again from different perspectives. My own journey, uh, if you'll indulge me for just a moment, has been in the curious one, mainly because I am hyper aware of the visual ambiguity that my presence uh, presents as a woman of mixed heritage. And there was one incident very specifically, many, many, <laughs> actually probably millions throughout my life that have kept me on this journey, but one specifically in 1992, 1993, that broke me just a little bit. So I wanted to put up this quote, many things broke my heart, but fixed my vision. To share with you, oh, here I hit return on the next slide and get a little heart shaken. I was on the Donahue show in, 19, in the early 1990s um, and experienced an ambush. So what happened is I was brought, I was in Essence Magazine, interviewed for uh, my perspectives on mixed heritage, and then received an invitation from the producers of The Donahue Show, a very popular talk show at the time, um, to come on and share those perspectives with two other authors. And we were all gonna go talk about colorism in the black community. I was not told that there would be additional guests on the show, and I was kept in a separate dressing room and then brought onto stage and then ambushed with numbers of other guests that had some hostilities and some resentments against uh, more fair-skinned black women. And I had to, with my heart thumping and my breath taken, gather myself on national television, live television, and steady myself enough to hold my own against uh, a panel of folks that wanted to take me down and make me the enemy not knowing that I myself cannot pass for white. I don't pass for white. And I receive the same discrimination that many of them also receive. Different types of discrimination, but plenty of discrimination nonetheless. Uh, I even stood up during the commercial break and said to the audience, we have all been brought here with the intent of solving a problem, but we are being engineered into conflict. I myself will not go with that bandwagon. If you wanna join me, you're welcome to change the conversation. And from that point on, um, I stood my ground and held my own, received book offers and all kinds of other things. But I was so scarred from the ambush and from feeling like I wanted to make a difference and that I wanted to contribute, but had been stung and treated as a, as a token and made the poster child for an issue that I did not want to be known for. So I took some re retreat and started to prepare myself so that I would never feel that I was in that position again. And I realized that in my own study of racism, I always needed to understand the personal level of my engagement, the interpersonal skill sets that I had in discussing the issue with others, 
the communal representation of these issues and how they manifested in the ecospheres and environments that I inhabited, and the systemic and structural ways in which racism was being enacted and the legacy of colonialism was being perpetuated in the United States and in many other places on the planet. I've received the same colorism in Africa, in Europe, in um, all over the place where I've traveled. So um, the resources that we're bringing to you today toggle between all of these areas, personal, interpersonal, communal, and systemic and structural racism, because in truth, it was heart-wrenching, it was hurtful, it was hard. But I realized I didn't have to relive it over and over and over again, but that I had to give myself some power and some sovereignty to speak my truth from whatever vantage point I inhabit in the Black community. So with the following resources, we hope that you can get started. I've collected all of the books that I have personally enjoyed and found incredibly valuable, even if I disagreed with them, and put them on a resource page, which you've been hearing throughout this presentation. So there's the link to the resources. And then uh, more recently, I've given you a link to an open letter that I wrote to uh, colleagues in my field of study as a professor in the theater and dance department, um, tackling some of the racist and problematic practices that exist in our community. That open letter uh, that was published just this year has gone to hundreds of countries and has changed practices. And it's very inspiring to see the change, but it's also healing to have so many kindred spirits come forward and say, I feel the same thing. I would like to see this change too, you're not alone. So for what it's worth, start your journey enjoy these resources, and also enjoy some of the artwork we're trying to bring you today. You wanted to get very creative in bringing this list of information to you. Back so to I, I, I want to underline <clears throat> what Donna was just saying. Um, I, I speak with people in the Ombuds office who sometimes say, are so discouraged and feel like engaging in a risky conversation about race um, can only bring bad things. And I'd like to encourage all of you that, in fact, really positive things can come out of these kinds of conversations. Um, communities can be drawn together. Um, significant, lasting change can happen. So we're going to introduce you here to Deepa Iyer's Social Change Ecosystem Framework. And Donna introduced this to me over the weekend, and I find this incredibly helpful because you can see in the middle, there is this equality, liberation, justice, solidarity circle. And all of these circles around contribute to that. And it's a validation that many different ways of working with this issue of racism help. There's not a single way. And so in case you cannot see the text very well, I'm going to read to you, starting at the top, the gray circle, what the different um, roles are that uh, Deepa Iyer has uh, identified. Weavers, experimenters, frontline responders, visionaries, builders, caregivers, disruptors, healers, storytellers, guides. So I have been trying to make a difference in this area of racism in this country for decades now. And one of the experiences that I've had that this uh, social change ecosystem really helps to give meaning to is that I'm not always welcome. Um, there are folks often fitting into the model of disruptors or visionaries or frontline responders who really do not want white folks involved in moving the issue forward. Um, and what I find is I need to respect that 
absolutely that is a choice and a desire that they're making i'm not going to force myself on on a particular group and i also know now from experience there are all, look at all the other circles that are left there are people working in all these other ways that welcome what i can do and what i can offer and so if you are venturing into this arena for the first time i'd like to encourage you first of all as a, a little bit of a reference to w kamal bell's work who has noted that when white people are shaken up and want to do something they will step into this issue of racism and think they should know how to do it right and he says you're just babies you're just learning how could you possibly do everything right and to allow yourself to make mistakes because you will being aware of this and self-correcting i love donna's phrase of fumbling forward and secondly that <clears throat> you can find people that want to work with you and engage with you um, who are working towards a better you know truly a better united states and a better world who will be glad to have your input but being respectful and knowing that if you're starting you're starting you know Beginner's mind is a term that comes from Buddhism, really understanding that you are just beginning your first steps. Did you want to chime in, Donna, before I launch the poll? Okay, so I'm going to launch a poll here. Um, and I, we're going to ask you to decide which of these roles is the most comfortable for you as a primary role. I'll launch the poll for you. Okay, thank you, Donna. So think about, you know, what makes the most sense to you in terms of, like, I'm an introvert. I'm not going to show up to a protest. I don't like crowds to start with. But there are other things I can do. There are things I can do, um, organizations that I can support. There are people that are doing work that are, is incredible that I can support financially, for example. So we've got about 44% of you who have voted at this point. Oh, I love this. So we have a, we have a beautiful spread, about 76% of you have voted. I won't close the polling yet, but we have a lovely spread of where people feel they fit. Um, it's fantastic. We have a, a group of weavers a few experimenters, a few visionaries, a group of builders, a larger group of caregivers, uh, a couple of disruptors, healers, um, storytellers, guides, and let's see if I can, I'm not seeing the rest. Looks like that's all I'm going to be able to see. Uh, as um, I scroll down, we've got uh, about three people said storytellers, two people said guides, two people said visionaries, five said weavers, uh, two said experimenters. Uh, we've had no one identify as a frontline responder. Understandable. It is tough to put oneself out there. It really is. I myself am trained as a frontline responder and uh, have tried to build my rapid response muscle as much as possible. But it's always um, a tumble of chemicals in the bloodstream to do that. So I just ended the poll and I'm sharing the results with you. So the, um, the largest single group was caregivers. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I love, you know, I think this is a great representation of how we all have a variety of, of, of innate abilities, training, experience, and we can help in so many different ways. And in truth, we need all of those roles filled. Um, it takes all of us to move the yeah. needle on the dial and to actually blast it into a better zone. Here on our own campus, oh, forgive the quick fingers there. 
here on our own campus, we wanted to let you know that there are some resources available and some magnificent people doing the work here already. I wanted to make sure you knew about them. So we've put a list of things there that are also duplicated on the Ombuds page um, and will be included in all of the resources that you will receive in an email after this presentation. So the Office of Equity, Diversity and Community Engagement, Center for Inclusion and Social Change, the Center for Teaching and Learning, CU Boulder Student Dialogue Series, um, the Office of Undergraduate Education, the Libraries has put up anti-racism resources, the Ombuds Office bringing you this program today, Human Resources and the Office of Institutional Equity and Compliance, Women and Gender Studies did a tremendous program on anti-Black racism within communities of color. We put a link up to uh, the YouTube of their presentation town hall. And many of the schools on campus and units and uh, programs have deans of diversity and inclusion. Uh, so again, many, many resources on campus and many of those resources busy and flooded right now. So we ask for you to always think about um, the amount of care that they put into their work and the amount of dedication and personal sacrifice that goes into being a frontline responder and always work with compassion. I'd like to highlight um, one of the resources because it's relatively new. It's Human Resources colon Teresa Hernandez. She is the Diversity Search and Program Outreach Manager. She, um, with David Pacheco, can work with your departments when you are in a hiring mode. What, and we know that there's a pause on hiring right now, not all positions, but most. Um, she can come and work with your department to make sure things like um, the language that's used in your job ads uh, is as broad and inclusive as possible um, to make sure that the practices you're engaging in in the search process are as broad and inclusive as possible. This position was created a couple of years ago. I worked with Teresa. She's a wonderful, warm human being, and she would love to help your departments with these searches. We mentioned TED Talks because they have been so instrumental for many people in getting introduced to new ideas. And so, the TED platform has organized a curated list of 250 TED Talks to help you understand racism. And so I posted some of the titles here, if that would be a fun place for you to start exploring. The Danger of a Single Narrative, How Racism Makes Us Sick, Racism Has a Cost for Everyone, um, How to Deconstruct Racism One Headline at a Time, What It Takes to Be Racially Literate. So, it's an amazing list with some of the top anti-racism scholars, workers, and um, frontline responders sharing their wisdom. Uh, so go right to the source and let them speak to you through the TED Talks. There's another uh, wonderful website called Race Forward, and they have a very impressive video series on systemic racism. Um, the host of the series is a wonderful scholar, DJ, Jay Smooth, historian. And so for example, some of the topics that they cover in their systemic racism series deal with wealth gap, housing discrimination, infant mortality, employment practices, government surveillance of communities of color, incarceration, forced labor, very, very well done. And so we um, will make sure that your follow-up email includes the direct link. You can also screenshot this slide and uh, not wait for the follow-up email. Go there right after lunch and start enjoying. Of course, I don't mean to tell you not to do your work. Black academics. Uh, there is a wonderful group called Academics for Black Survival and Wellness, but they welcome membership 
from anyone who would like to support Black academics. And they have a series of workshops, the next series coming up in August. Uh, they also sponsor podcasts. Um, they provide a resource list with literature and documentaries, television productions, many articles. And so there is the link to their resource page. There's also the National Council for Black Studies um, that supports the work of Black scholars trying to bring truth forward, trying to bring the invisibilized view of America more onto the salient radar. And I'm so sorry. Apparently it bounced me into the link. Let me get back to the slide. There we go. Not sure why that happened again. Let's see if we can, there we go. Kiersey. So we were trying to think about, you know, what's a common starting point um, and what would be a you know, baseline um, touchstone reference point uh, for doing this work. And we started talking about human rights and we realized there are um, many views and definitions of human rights. So we um, decided to refer to the United Nations Bill of Human Rights because currently worldwide, it is the most widely accepted document that describes human rights. So I'm gonna just read this a little bit. Human rights are rights inherent to all human beings, regardless of race, sex, national na nationality, ethnicity, language, religion, or any other status. Human rights include the right to life and liberty, freedom from slavery and torture, freedom of opinion and expression, the right to work and education and many more. Everyone is entitled to these rights without discrimination. Um, so, you know, we felt that that is one way, having a baseline definition of what are we working toward is one way to, um, to support good work and also notice when people may be um, deviating from a positive goal. Your resource guide will include a link to the United Nations International Bill of Human Rights. It's a collective of three different documents that were ratified in 1948 and have been translated into over 500 languages. So that if you'd like to share it with friends around the globe and get this document back into conversation, please do so. And at this point, we wanted to emphasize that as you walk this path, you may encounter a little bit of broken glass. You may experience encounters and emotions that um, can scramble you and make you wonder if you're doing the right thing. What's important to understand is that grief and anger is a very important part of encountering this path and that you may encounter individuals that need a place to heal their grief, that need a moment to vent their anger. If you feel strong enough to be the recipient of that and to provide sincere listening and a space for civility, then that makes you a very powerful light worker on this path. Know that deconstructing internalized racism is a very layered process. Uh, for communities of color and specifically black and African descended communities. It is hard to know that this transgenerational trauma stretches from before your lifetime and at the moment threatens to potentially endure beyond your own lifeline. To know that you are bringing your children into this kind of environment and that you have to try and help them find ways to navigate a reality that very few understand. And at times, the internalized racism can scramble us as well. Um, I can share a story about the famed Alvin Ailey Dance Company um, being commended as a beacon of Black pride and the exhibitors of tremendous athleticism 
and black artistry on stage and dance in the United States. They are, matter of fact, the number one touring dance company in the United States. What's not known is even this amazing beacon of strength and pride in the black community suffered its own internalized racism. When back in the 1970s and 1980s, they had a requirement that anyone going into the professional wing of the company, women specifically, would have to chemically straighten their hair so it could be pulled back into a bun. Um, that is not the case anymore, but it, it is these um, internalized racism nodes in our history that we are still contending with, that we are still navigating and unpacking a little bit at a time. Um, matter of fact, my own journey with hair, just to share a quick story, uh, the woman who did my hair, Dr. Joanne Cornwell, is a professor of Black Studies uh, in San Diego, and she created a system of locking that she calls Sister Locks, and worn by thousands, possibly millions of women around the planet. She was sued by the California Board of Cosmetology for operating without a license to do hair, without a cosmetology license. She countersued saying, why on earth would I get your license? Because you're not doing anything that I'm doing. You teach people that in order to manage or style black hair, it has to be chemically altered. I don't even use scissors for what I do, let alone locking agents or chemicals. And the state of California Supreme Court agreed with her. And so all of us who wear our hair naturally no longer have to get licensing to work on our own hair from whiteboards of cosmetology. So again, we tackle these, um, these hegemonic tools one at a time. And sometimes we realize that we've embedded some of the values and other times we can feel right away that the values are untrue and they need to be challenged. So please be patient with all on this path not knowing where they are in the continuum of resolving internalized racism for themselves. Know that territorialism with people saying, you're not welcome here, it represents self-preservation. It represents someone who feels at some level they don't know um, how to negotiate your presence um, because there has been harm. It's maybe people uh, within the Black Lives Matter movement. It may be people in conservative pro-white movements. Um, the truth is, rather than judging, know that behind a request for territorialism and an enforcement of it is usually self-preservation and to find some healing compassion. Internalizers and externalizers respond differently, right? Some people will really go within themselves and withdraw from you. Other people may really want to talk uh, to the point of <laughs> potentially imposing themselves on you, but know that we all respond differently. You are going to encounter personal triggers as you do this work. There's no question that at some point you will encounter information that may feel personally harmful, painful, that you need to sit with and heal or get assistance with. And to know that um, that's part of negotiating the broken glass on this path. At the core of it, whatever material you engage, whatever resources you employ, do those resources promote coercion and override basic human rights in order to promote an agenda? Then perhaps you want to disengage. Then perhaps you want to uh, not let it poison your well. Kirsi, my friend, anything to add here? You know, <clears throat> you know, I've, I, I've shared that I've been on this path for decades now and trying to learn and understand and make change. And yet there are, there are materials that I have to shield myself from. Um, for example, um, in general, I am, I really don't handle, uh, visual images of violence, uh, well at all. And so I avoid violent movies. Um, and so even though there are some excellent movies and documentaries, 
that talk about slavery, talk about African-American experience in the United States, um, if they're including uh, images of violence, I personally, um, I, I can't bear it. I literally will have nightmares for months and sometimes years. So I don't just disengage from that particular material. What I do is I try to find it in another format. I can tolerate um, the same um, descriptions and histories in a written format much better. And I can also titrate it so that I can, you know, read something, put it down. For example, I did that with ta Coates' Between the World and Me. It was such a painful read for me that I would read a chapter and set it aside and give myself some days of, of space before I went back to that book again. So that was a way that I uh, managed the painfulness of the material um, so that I can continue to be a functioning human being. And I understand that that is a privilege, that I can set something down. And there are people by virtue of how they look who cannot stop the inflow of pain, of hurt that's inflicted on them. And I understand that that is an enormous privilege that I have that I can choose not to watch a movie. I can choose not to read an entire book in a sitting that to take it in pieces. I have family members who, when the movie 12 Years a Slave came out, um, ancestors, um, we are the descendants of of people who suffered slavery and were enslaved. And um, the, I had elders, family members who said, I wish I could see it, but I can't go see that movie. It's too painful, it hurts too much. It's too traumatizing to relive their own experience of subjugation or Jim Crow segregation. Um, pain, beatings. So um, heal, help yourself, create a safe circle of people that love you, that can listen to you. Try and find a way to stay in the conversation, knowing that at some point you will encounter something that may change you profoundly and to build your courage for continuing to encounter. When it comes to racism, much of it feels nonsensical and indefensible. We appreciate a series that PBS has produced called Origin of Everything. And Kirsi introduced me to this source. Um, wanted to put up a few of the subject matters that they cover in the series, which is also duplicated on YouTube. Why did Europeans enslave Africans? What's the origin of race in the USA? What is racial passing? What does it mean to pass for white? What is cultural appropriation? Are museums ethical? Should they be disbanded? Why are there so many Confederate monuments? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I really, found the series fantastic and we recommend it. It will be part of your resource list. Additionally, there are resources outside of uh, the studies of racism in the United States and black identity studies that we wanted to say are worth checking out because they really relate strongly to building your own personal and interpersonal resources on this issue. So looking at the field of diplomacy studies, uh, the Social Justice Mediation Institute led by Leah Wing in Massachusetts has some fantastic articles and programs. There is a new field called abolitionist and social justice somatic work about working with the physical body and our sense of representation and identity in the body and the experience of walking the earth in the bodies in which we were born. 
conflict and peace studies, crisis intervention training, non-defensive communication, and non-violent communication. There are many, many titles in these areas. Right now, I'm enjoying uh, one called uh, Taking the War Out of Our Words by Sharon Steller. Highly recommend that book in the area of non-defensive communication. Kiersey, do you have any favorite titles that you are reading right now? We've spent so many hours of talking about these resources. I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> <laughs> But just to know that for me, literature is my first go-to, then I usually okay. follow up and go into film, go into documentaries, uh, attending, of course, community gatherings, experiential learning, but literature is always a favorite place to curl up for me with a book. Okay, I, I finally came up with something. Ah. Ibram Candy's A Definitive History of Racist Ideas in the United States. Stamped um, thing. Hmm. Stamped, his book Stamped. Yes, that's another great one too. Um, and I haven't read all of Stamped, but there is also a junior version of Stamped, co-written by a young, uh, a young adult author um, that I will be sharing with my son in a year or two. And it's about, you know, middle school, junior high age, but, um, but I, but having not grown up entirely in this country, I like this idea of, of, of reading through the definitive history because I do feel like there's a lot of piece of information that I'm missing. And quite frankly, you know, this history is not taught in our schools. So it's good for me to be informed. Vloggers, we cannot ignore the many wonderful people that are contributing to the blogosphere with their conversational videos and their educational videos. Uh, these are, this is a very inadequate list. It's a starter list of some folks who have been at it for a while and have really gained a strong reputation for having waterproof and bulletproof conversations in the public sphere uh, about the history and the legacy of racism in our country. Um, so we put up lots of names and links, but I also wanted to invite you to use the chat now. Are you connected to any vloggers or YouTubers that you find incredibly inspiring? Please let us know. Open up that chat and tell us what you'd like to look at. Trevor Nawa. The link for Jay Smooth isn't working. Yes, we know uh, the links don't always work from Zoom, but we'll send it to you afterwards. Yeah, you'll get the live link in your resources. Podcast. Yeah, White Lies, a terrific podcast by NPR. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't see anything else coming in. So, but those are great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what's amazing about this current era in history is up to this point, up until you know, 2011, 2010, scholars spoke for communities of color. Scholars interpreted and presented the histories of communities of color. We now have self-publication to the internet where people can tell their own story. And it has completely invigorated and uh, democratized the conversation mm. that people can speak for themselves as well. It has brought accountability into the public sphere for the kind of aggressions that the black community receives. And so it's wonderful for people to be able to say, this is my story, I'm gonna tell it to you directly. That's why we, uh, don't see academic publishing catching up as quickly. I know that as a professor on this campus, I include materials in my courses um, that are first person uh, sources from vloggers, from writers who are self-publishing to the internet. Those materials have not gone through the customary route of peer review that we consider so important in academic publishing. It is because uh, the dinosaur of the academy is a little slow 
to actually gather those stories and attend to them. And I don't feel that we have to wait. So we've got a couple other comments. One is Liz uh, uh, found another link for J Smooth. And then um, there's another, some uh, list of resources, Warmth of Other Suns. Yes. By Wilkerson, Color yes. of Law by Rothstein, and How to Be an Anti-Racist by Kindy. Nice. Thank you, everyone. The most important and enjoyable discovery is that there's no finish line. Mm -hmm. That it is an ongoing enrichment of your intellect and enlargement of your heart and aggrandizement of your vision. That you will continue to grow and expand and not only letting the Black Lives Matter movement inspire you to familiarize yourself with the Black community, but to find out how Indigenous peoples have been invisibilized, to look at immigrant communities, to look at neighboring communities, and um, to really understand Latinx voices, to understand queer representation in the public sphere, to look at the politicization of um, different causes um, to understand that the human tapestry, as rich as it is, each perspective has some, a very important contribution to make to our understanding of ourselves. And the Black Lives Matter movement has hopefully fueled you to start that journey, but expand it in many directions with no finish line. Our next conversation will be our last in this series. We'll be talking about acting with integrity, ways of choosing to put one foot in front of the other and actually take public and personal action against racism, taking a stand against racism. Kiersey, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add on this slide? Um, well, I mean, the next um, episode is really where the rubber hits the road, you know, and how to put this all together, uh, the listening, the learning, being, standing on your own feet, being grounded in the moment, understanding from learning through uh, resources, and then moving to action. And I have to say that this is where I personally feel like um, the journey is lifelong. Um, it never ceases to amaze me the kinds of weird curveballs on this topic that come my way. And, you know, even last night, I just ran into something completely novel with a neighbor and I didn't have the wherewithal to figure out how to respond. I will respond. I'm going to take a time to think about it. Next time I see the neighbor, which I will, um, think about how I want to. So I think um, for all of us being persistent, being kind with ourselves, these are important uh, pieces for being able to stay in, the, in this journey for the long haul. I'm thinking about an article about the semiotics of tourism, the word tourism. And there is an analogy in the article that says, are you a tourist or a traveler in your journey as a person? A tourist is someone that will expect convenience, ease, entertainment, want everything to be palatable and made easily accessible. But if you're a traveler, you are someone who knows that you may get lost once in a while. You may get mud on your pants. You may not fully know the language or be able to comprehend what's happening in your environment perfectly at all times. You may not have all of your needs met with immediacy. But by going on the journey, you will be transformed and to trust that process of transformation. And knowing that when you come home, when you find yourself a home and you land, you will be much bigger much deeper, much broader than who you were when you began the journey. So for what it's worth, the next 
part of this journey and acting with integrity excites us very much. We look forward to giving you actionable items. We now would like to open to Q and A. Please okay. share your thoughts. Yeah, Donna and Kirzy, this is Liz. You do have one. Um, if you open up your Q and A, you have one under answer that I just had asked them to kind of wait until now. So that let's do that one first, and then you do have one under open. Okay. Um, why don't I read this? Um, it says OIC is not trusted by many students, staff, and faculty of color, including Black and Indigenous. They protect reverse racism. Can you talk about how this perpetuates institutional racism? Can you also talk about how reverse racism is a product of white fragility? Thank you. So, um, so let me first just address um, you know, what is OIC? Um, they are created by federal statutes and so they are both created and limited by what is in the federal statutes. Um, federal law is um, clumsy and um, broad brushed in many cases and so they can and do do only very specifically what the law uh, charges them to do. Um, having worked with people in that office, first, I know they recognize, I mean, if you talk with Valerie Simons, she recognizes this, and they do actively try to find ways uh, to mitigate the shortcomings. Um, and I know that's not an answer to your full question, but I just wanted to say that up front that the specific office in our university doesn't uh, necessarily have control over um, all aspects of their operation. And it would be important to emphasize that that doesn't mean that we are powerless to further action um, and that um, there are now inclusivity email networks on campus. There are deans of inclusivity, and it's an opportunity to gather as a community and voice thoughts, concerns, and create action items um, if we feel the institution is not responding uh, quickly enough, directly enough, um, that doesn't mean that it stops there. Yeah, and I think um, we often forget this, that we as community members all have uh, power in our voices and we often underestimate that. Um, the kinds of changes that most of the folks that I talk to who come to the Ombuds office is accessible through uh, university leadership at various levels and not necessarily through the office that enforces Title VII and Title IX, which is OIEC. Um, I don't want to discount them as partners. I have seen situations in which they have found um, they have been helpful and they also do try to refer people to the Ombuds office when they are not able to address a concern because of the limitations in those statutes. Um, there is a question here about talking about how reverse racism is a product, product of white fragility. Um, if we can talk about that as well. Uh, reverse racism within communities of color, I'm assuming that question is referring to. Um, Hang yeah. on. Um, um, the person says that OIC protects reverse racism. And can we talk about how this perpetuates institutional racism and also talk about how reverse racism is a product of white fragility? Um, so we so might start by defining what reverse racism is. Yeah. Yeah. So reverse racism is uh, a terminology that evolved 
to refer to what many people perceived as defensiveness or acts of hostility from communities of color when they were defending themselves. So there are some people that feel that reverse racism at this point does not resist, does not exist, uh, because communities of color have not had a sovereign voice or a full access to their own power. Uh, so acts of resistance cannot be acts of racism. They are acts of resistance um, against power structures. And another perspective on reverse racism is that, yes, communities of color through internalized racism can very much um, enact the same, uh, inflict the same suffering that they themselves have received through white oppression. And so um, there are many beautiful and varying opinions on all of this. Um, so I would like to acknowledge both um, portions of the continuum that have um, presented arguments on this idea. And um, quite honestly, I feel that this is Donna Mejia answering, not speaking on behalf of CU, but answering completely for myself. I want to own this. Um, each instance that may be potentially labeled reverse racism has everything to do with the power differential between the parties involved and an analysis of what that power differential is. And unless that power differential is called out, named, expressed, defined, then we need to figure out whether or not it was an act of resistance or an act of aggression. Okay, so we have a thank you. I, um, I hope that that answered your question. Um, you know, I know that we're at one o'clock, so if you need to go, go ahead. If you have more questions. There is one you. more in the Q&A, Kirzi. It says, yes. can you talk about ways how CU perpetuates systemic racism? Um, I can give an example. Uh, it's something that we actually tackled in the theater and dance department some time ago. Um, for example, students who were auditioning for the dance degree, at many points throughout this university's history, they had to do ballet and modern dance in their interview and their audition for our university. And um, years ago, we put up our hands and said, why are we requiring a Eurocentric form as a central reference point for whether or not someone has the competency to dance. Why on earth are we doing that? So we got rid of it. And so students can audition into our program using their home dance form, whatever they'd like to use, whether it's hip hop, baratnatiam, whether it's Mexican folklorico, whether it's aerial dance, you name it, flamenco, transnational fusion, belly dance, it is all welcomed. And so that's one way our department started to say, this is a systemic racism that we've been implicitly and complicitly supporting for years. Let's stop, let's change it. Um, so that's from my own home department. And I think each department would be wise to look at the ways in which some of their publishing standards, their um, requirements for tenure, their curricular core requirements are reinforcing the narrative of Eurocentricity. Yeah, and I think I have a broader answer to that question, which is that, um, you know, living in the United States, we are all swimming in this racist soup, and it is impossible to not be affected by that, all of us, whether it's internalized racism, um, when we're talking about people and communities of color, uh, whether it is white supremacy, um, when we're talking about the privilege that white folks have in this society, um, it permeates our systems, our structures um, throughout the country. And so um, I think a lot of that is invisible. And I don't have specific examples uh, with CU Boulder, but I just wanna say that 
you know, it's an inescapable influence in this country. Um, and I think all colonizing countries, um, if you want to take it a little bit broader uh, than that. Um, I do also want to comment that there are a number of people on this campus that recognize that and are working to dismantle those pieces of our systems that are inherently racist and have more equitable systems in place. Um, you know, I know, for example, HR is revising um, requirements, hiring requirements and recruitment, how this recruitment is done. Um, and, you know, as is true everywhere in the United States, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but that's the lens with which I tend to see this. And actually globally, because in the form of colonized countries as well, there's so much internalized colonialist um, values that there's a lot of work to be done um, to uh, revise and refresh cultures. And I speak from a, having grown up in a country that was colonized. And so um, it was colonized until my grandparents' generation. But there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so. And with that, uh, there's a perpetual call to diversify CU Boulder, to bring more diverse voices into our campus, into our leadership. Yes to that. I cheer that wholeheartedly. But that doesn't mean we have to wait for demographic representation to calibrate before we change our ideologies and our practices. And so we hope that you'll join us next week for the last series where we start to talk about actionable items. And until then, take good care. And please know if you missed other episodes in this series, uh, we recorded them all and they are on this uh, CU Boulder Ombuds website under Lunch and Learn and also under Standing Against Racism uh, pages. So, so good to have all of you here today. Thank you. And Liz, thank you very much yes. for keeping us organized. I so appreciate you. Take care, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you both. Bye-bye.